Before we get into the video, I'm curious to know if DaVinci Resolve is your first editing software or not. Let me know down in the comments if it is or if it isn't. For me personally, this is my third professional editing software that I've used, not including Windows Movie Maker or iMovie. But I say all of that just to let you know that I know that DaVinci Resolve may seem confusing at first, it may seem even intimidating when you first open it up, but that's why we're making this video to show you how easy it is to color grade within DaVinci Resolve. Now I'm not gonna go over every single feature and we're not gonna go through every single nook and cranny of DaVinci Resolve, but, but we are gonna go through our fair share of nooks. And if we have time, we might even go through a cranny or two. So sit back, maybe grab a notebook, do whatever you gotta do, try to remove any distractions if possible because we're gonna go over my personal color grading workflow within DaVinci Resolve and we're gonna go through quite a few of the basics as well as a few advanced techniques. That way the next time you open up DaVinci, you're not gonna be freaked out, you're not gonna be intimidated, you're gonna import your footage, you're gonna look at it and say, all right, S-Log 2, 3, Canon, Panasonic footage, whatever you got. Call me the professor because uh, I'm gonna grade you with color. They call me the color professor. Heard of the nutty professor? I'm the color, okay. So we're here in DaVinci Resolve in the color tab selected at the bottom here. And first off, I just wanna go through some of the common tools that I use almost every single time. Let's start with the primary color wheels. So we have our lift, gamma, gain, offset. We have some of the color bars, if you prefer this as well. Same thing, lift, gamma, gain. And then we also have our shadows, midtones, and highlights. Now, if you are one of those people who think that lift gamma gain is the exact same as shadows, midtones, and highlights, don't worry. I used to think that as well, but let me show you what the difference is. So to show you the difference, I've pulled in this black to white gradient here, nothing special. And I've also got my waveform opened here in the bottom right. You can view several different scopes at one time if you want, or if you only wanna look at one, you can just choose whether that's parade, vector scope, histogram, whatever you want. You can also open up the window and view two, or even four at any given time. So the reason I opened up this black to white gradient, I want you to pay attention to the waveform and watch what happens as we make adjustments. So let's start here with the lift. I'm gonna bring it up and notice what's happening down in the waveform. It's kind of acting like this accordion, right? Where I'm starting to make adjustments here down in the shadows, but it's kind of like this ripple effect is happening to the midtones and then to even the highlights. Now let's hop over into the shadows and let's make the exact same adjustment, but really pay attention to the waveform here. Isn't that fascinating? So it's almost doing a similar motion where our effect in the shadows is being made, but there is no ripple effect. There is no accordion thing happening here. Pretty much nothing above this dotted mid-tone line is being affected. So that's really important to know, right? Because if you wanna make those fine-tuned micro adjustments, you're better off doing that in the shadows, mid-tones, and highlights, as opposed to the lift gamma gain, which is gonna give you a much more gradual effect over the entire image, regardless if you're in lift, gamma, or gain. Up here, we also have some other tabs that we can choose on, like our HDR color wheels, uh, using some motion effects, like some noise reduction, motion blur, and there's some other effects here that we won't go into today. Moving over here into the middle, we have our curves, which we have our classic tone curve right here. We can also get into our hue, saturation, and luminance curves. Next, we have this fun little spider web thing, which is the color warper. We have our qualifier tool. We have our power windows, tracker, magic mask, blur, which can also add sharpening as well, as well as our key output. Now, again, we're not gonna go over every single one of these tabs, but I will go over later the most important ones that I use on a daily basis. All right, now we're gonna jump into our nodes. And so I opened up an old project that I've already color graded, but I decided to go ahead and uncolor grade some of the clips here. And so right over here in our workspace, this is gonna be where our nodes are located. If you don't see this, just go ahead and click the nodes option up here at the top. So we're gonna click in this little graph here, and we're gonna go ahead and add what is called serial nodes. So to do that, the hotkey is Alt plus S. 
We're just gonna add a few nodes here. If you wanna find where all these hotkeys are, just go up to DaVinci Resolve, Keyboard Customization, and you can make all of your changes there. Now I know for a lot of you, nodes can just be a very weird concept to wrap your mind around. So I'm gonna do my best to try to explain what a node is and why it is so valuable. So within DaVinci Resolve, we have two types of nodes. We have serial nodes, which is what you're looking at right here. And then we also have what are called parallel nodes. Today, I'm only going to be using serial nodes, but I wanna talk about what parallel nodes are and why you might use them. So, so to start off, let's look at what these things are doing. So we have our source right here, which is going to be our footage. And this line is going into node number one. And what makes nodes slightly different than adjustment layers is that nodes are taking information from one and you can tell by this arrow right here, it is being fed into the next. Or a different way to think about it is say, node number two is getting its data and its information from node number one as indicated by this arrow. Now we can remove this arrow if we want, and now node number two is getting its information from actually nowhere. So if I select node number two and I try to say, let's add some saturation, let's add some contrast, let's boost it over here. Notice, right, how nothing is happening to our footage because it is not connected to any source. Node number two is literally not getting any information fed to it. But now look what happens if I grab node number one and I connect it, Oh yeah, baby, we are now cooking right here. So to get rid of any effects in a node, just right click, reset, node, great. Now let's talk about parallel nodes really, really quickly. So let's just say for the sake of argument, I'm gonna you know, bring some saturation and some contrast into this first node. But let's just say in node number two, I decide, you know what? We're gonna take away all of our saturation. Now, if we were using adjustment layers, we could go just into that next node or that next layer and bring that saturation back in. But in nodes, if I try to add that saturation, look what happens. I can't because once again, the information and data that node number three is getting is coming from node number two. And in node number two, we took away all information and data of saturation. Therefore, we cannot add to something that is not there to begin with. However, if we decided that we wanted to add a parallel node, you can see what's happening is that node number one, it is now sending information not only into node number two, but it's now also sending it into node number three. Remember earlier we tried with node number three, we tried to add saturation back into the image, but now our node number three is actually getting its information from node number one as opposed to node number two. And so watch what happens as we try to add that saturation we actually have data and information to manipulate. I really hope that made sense. If it didn't, ask me a question down below, either myself or hopefully somebody else in the community who is much smarter than I am can help further explain it to you. Okay, so that is parallel nodes versus serial nodes. Now a few more things to get into before I actually show you the color grading process. One thing that's really neat is that you can go ahead and label your nodes. I have my hotkey for labeling set to F1, but again, you can go ahead in your custom keybinds and change it to whatever you want. So for node number one, I'm gonna label it NR, which stands for noise reduction. Node number two, I'm gonna label it PRI for primary. Node three, I'm gonna label it LUT for lookup table. And node four, CST for color space transform. And then one thing that's really cool is that you can actually quickly enable or disable a node. So just hit Control D or Command D if you're on Mac and you can see it getting grayed out here. And you can even highlight all of them, enable and disable them. Okay, so now we're finally done with all of the just workspace information, kind of getting you familiar with what DaVinci Resolve looks like and all the different things that you can do in it. Now let's finally get into the color grading process. All right, so I have my nodes. I've got them all labeled and we're just going to do today a very simple four node color grade. So I'm actually going to begin at the very end with my color space transform. I'm gonna go up into my effects panel up here, find color space transform and drag it on. I should probably back up and say that I shot this footage in S log three on the new Sony a7 IV. So that's why I'm using a color space transform because what I wanna do is I'm going to now input our color space 
which what I just said is Sony S Game at 3. Cine and S Log 3. So we're, we're telling it what we shot it in, what the input source is, and the output is using our timeline settings, which is set to Rec. 709. This is really cool because no matter what camera you're shooting on, if you're shooting in log or an HLG format, you can find just about all of that right here. Now I know some of you must be wondering, hold on, I've always been taught that you convert your footage first and then you add all of your effects on top of that. How come you converted your footage at the very end? Let's get into it. So the reason that I converted my footage at the end here is because again, the power of serial nodes where each node is being fed into the next one, we want all of our effects, all of our adjustments, our corrections, our creative color grade, we want all of that to take place from our source, which is Sony S-Log3. If, if the very first thing we did was in node number one and we did our CST, then every effect that's happening afterwards is not being done within the logarithmic color space, it's being done in Rec. 709, which would defeat the entire purpose of shooting in log to begin with. Once again, this is more of an advanced technique or an advanced understanding, so please, if you have any questions, just let me know. So I know this is gonna just kinda hurt some people's brains at the beginning, and that's fine, it, it, it did that to me as well, but we're actually going to be working in reverse. So the next thing that I like to do is, I actually like to add my LUT by just simply right-clicking, going down into to the custom LUTs that I have. Now you don't have to add the LUT as your very next step, but for me personally, I like to get my colors dialed in first, and then we're gonna go into our primary node and start tweaking from there. Now one really cool thing about adding a LUT, let's just say uh, the LUT you're using is way too strong, you can actually go into our key output tab right here, make sure you have the LUT node selected, and then we can just go to the gain output and drag it down or drag it up and think of this as a LUT intensity slider. As we go into our primaries, this is where we're gonna start doing our color correction. And this is why it's so important to have your scopes open. But the reason we wanna use our scopes is because we don't wanna trust our eyes. We don't wanna trust our monitor because everybody's going to have a different setup. Some people are gonna have really, really expensive monitors that are perfectly you know, color and contrast accurate. Other people, like myself, you know, I'm using a $200 monitor, which it works good, but it's not like the highest grade, like scientifically accurate. So down here in our waveform, what I'm instantly noticing is that our highlights are getting just a bit close to clipping at the top. So again, having my primary node selected, I like to go here in the tone curve, and I'm just gonna start dropping down our highlights. I've got a ton of information like right down here, not quite in the shadows, not quite in the mid-tones, but somewhere in the middle there. And I kind of just want to add some contrast and start to like pull that apart a little bit more. So I'm just going to add a few more points onto our graph here, onto our tone curve here. And I'm just going to start playing with it and see what I can do to try to like stretch that out just a little bit more and add some contrast down in the shadows. I do like how that's starting to look, and so I'm just gonna do a Control D on this node. Okay, we're making very minor changes. You might not even, that might not even show for you if you're watching this on your iPhone. But now I'm gonna head over to my log wheel, and, and I can see that I still have some room to bring those shadows down. So I'm just gonna use our shadows, and we're gonna pull those down. I just really wanna make sure this beanie is nice and crispy black. To me, that's starting to look pretty decent. One thing that I almost always do is I add, you know, somewhat of a teal and orange look. Again, this depends on the scene, depends on the footage, but I almost always love just bringing some warmth into our highlights and then complement that with bringing some coolness into our shadows. And then kind of depending on how all of that looks with our midtones, I'm gonna go ahead and bring those to the warm side as well. And then, not always, again, just gotta feel it out, see what makes sense. Maybe I'm gonna add some saturation, maybe bump this up to like 55, maybe bring in some more contrast up here. And even as I do that, I can tell, okay, so this image is starting to look a little too warm. I'm just going to counteract that by maybe pulling our temperature down just a tad bit. And watch as I do that, right, our waveform is starting to even out right about there, starting to look fine for me. 
The last thing that I'm gonna do is our first node, which is going to be noise reduction. Now, in this particular shot, we don't have a whole lot of noise because it was incredibly well lit, well exposed, but there almost always is going to be some bit of noise. So what I like to do is just head over to our effects, get to the little search tab here and type in noise, click noise reduction, bring that over, and here is going to be our noise reduction effect. I usually always keep our first tab, temporal noise reduction, I almost always keep that set to default, which is right here. If anything at all, I'll drop the frames down to two, uh, but in this case, I'll keep it at three, and then our threshold, this is going to be the actual noise reduction effect. We're just going to slightly add about six. Looks good to me. Okay, that was a lot, <laughs> I know. And if you made it this far, I appreciate you, thank you. If you enjoyed this style of video, consider hitting that like button and let me know if you like these type of in-depth tutorials and if you wanna see more just like it. Feel free to uh, check out either one of these videos over here that YouTube thinks you might enjoy. And if that isn't enough for you, you can even subscribe to the channel by clicking this icon right over here. But thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.